Chicago and a, and a member of the Illinois Clinicians for Climate Action. I just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you that participated in the National Medical Consortium for Climate and Health Conference, which occurred over the weekend, thank you for joining us. I know it's been a, a really action-packed weekend so far, and I really appreciate you spending a little bit more of your time with us. For those that actually even lobby today, so as part of the conference, we had an opportunity to lobby uh, virtually in, on the Hill. So we were able to be with each state's uh, representatives in the House and the Senate today and advocate for how important uh, addressing climate change is, particularly in the setting of human health. For, so for, for you, thank you for, again, uh, sharing your evening with us. And I just wanna provide uh, the opportunity to thank the individual states that are represented here today. Uh, I've really had, uh, a wonderful time getting to know uh, representatives from each state through this whole lecture series. And I'd like to think we, did, uh, we were able to provide some really good information over the past few months discussions, uh, particularly the Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action, the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action, the Minnesota Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, and Ohio Clinicians for Climate Action. Uh, thank you uh, to each of you for, for really helping put together what has been a, an excellent webinar series. For those of you that are new to the each individual state's climate action group, welcome. Uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll place our contact information within the chat box and feel free to, to click and log on and learn more. Uh, we're really excited and passionate about this field and are really looking to reach out and, and bring on new members. So definitely something to check out. Um, so tonight's webinar uh, will provide insight into how climate change is already affecting urban communities and communities of color, as well as provide opportunities to address the social determinant of health. Now, social determinants of health are conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age, and that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. As me personally, a clinician in Chicago, the importance of these factors can be seen in the health disparities among communities. For example, on Chicago's west side, a predominantly African-American community, the average life expectancy is 69 years. Well, just seven miles east in the loop, life expectancy increases to 85 years. Overall, the life expectancy of Chicagoans in areas of economic hardship to five years lower than those living in better economic conditions. You know, patient-specific factors like unstable housing, drug addiction, immigration status, nutritional status and food insecurity, community violence and access to medical care contribute to patients' mental and physical health. And in addition, and the reason we're here, a growing body of evidence also highlights how pollution and climate change harm communities, particularly a toll on communities of color. So tonight we really have a powerhouse lineup of speakers. We have four individuals who teach, research, advocate, and problem solve solutions to the effects of climate change on human health, including communities of color. Starting us off tonight will be Natasha Desjarnet. She's an assistant professor in the Christina Lee Brown Environ Institute at the University of Louisville, Division of Environmental Medicine. She's also a member of the board of the Citizens Climate Education and Physicians for Social Responsibility. She's also on the advisory board for the Center for Climate Health and Equity at the American Public Health Association. Hopefully following her, depending on technical difficulties, will be Mila Marshall. She works to mobilize and energize diverse networks across Illinois around clean water issues related to wastewater, agriculture, and industry. For the Sierra Club, Mila works as the clean water advocate, advocating to protect the quality of streams, lakes, rivers, and Illinois tributaries, as well as mobilizing diverse networks around clean water issues. She's an expert on the cultural and social dimensions of urban environments. Following her will be Alina Grossman. She's Program Director at Building Resilience Against Climate Effects, or BRACE, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Now, BRACE studies the climate change public health impacts and supports communities in preparing for the climate concerns, such as air quality degradation, increased flooding, heat stress, poor respiratory health, and vector-borne disease. And bringing us home will be Ray Bell. He is Director of Programs at Faith in Place, which is an organization of diverse people of all faiths that share a commitment to care for the earth and provide resources to educate, connect, and advocate for healthier communities. In his role, Mr. Bell carries the overall responsibility for achieving measurable impacts for environmental justice. 
He has previously served as an outreach coordinator for the Water Preservation Program at Faith in Place, and he has a passion for economic and social justice and environmental issues. To keep the evening running smoothly and efficiently, our hope is to have our Q&A session at the end of the last discussant's lecture. However, if you have any questions during the event, please feel free to write them in our chat box and we will make sure to ask them at the conclusion of the speakers. So without further ado, Natasha, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. Hopefully everybody is seeing a slide. Can I get a maybe a thumbs up if you see a slide? Perfect, all right, thank you. Um, so excited to be here. I'm excited because I already got to see several of you at the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health annual meeting. I'm very much grateful for the opportunity to be here and celebrate all of the great work that you were doing, great, timely, and relevant work. And I applaud your, your efforts as trusted messengers and key interceptors to protect health in this changing climate. Before I dive into the aspects of climate health and justice, I'd love to share with you a little bit about our research center. I'm part of the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute, which is in the Division of Environmental Medicine at University of Louisville, established in 2018. So both genetic and environmental factors contribute to a person's well-being at risk. We fill a void through our framework to understand our environment as a whole through our interactions between the natural, social, and personal domain. To understand how the environment increases or decreases risk of developing heart disease, for example, we must understand the impact of the enviro and its specific domains on health. On the screen, you'll also see that I have included a citation from our foundational article, which was published when our center was established. And the Environment Institute is complete with seven collaborative research centers. We partner across disciplines to understand the environmental burdens of disease and to identify interventions to improve health and quality of life. Uh, so as we discuss climate justice this evening, I thought it would be helpful to share a little bit about how I got here. Um, I've been recently asked what led me on this path, and it goes back to my childhood. I am a child of the Great Migration, meaning that my parents grew up in the Jim Crow South of Birmingham, Alabama, and moved to points north to find opportunity. So I grew up in Kentucky, though I will say I was born in Michigan, which is home to several that are here tonight. So uh, glad to be amongst colleagues. Uh, but people of the Great Migration had to work hard to keep strong connections with the family back south, calling and visiting as often as they could. As such, they made sure that their children had strong bonds with their family, even though far away. So I spent a lot of time in Birmingham, Alabama as a child. Summers, school breaks, holidays, I got to play with my cousins, and here they are in these pictures. So if you're wondering who I am, I'm the child that's not looking at the camera in either photo. I have a blue tie on in the left photo and a red plaid dress on in the right. And we had so much fun running, playing, always out, outdoors, as you can see in the pictures here, with not a care in the world, except I had one care. I noticed at an early age that when I would visit my family in Birmingham, I couldn't breathe, that my very well-controlled asthma in Kentucky would flare up when I would visit my family there in Birmingham. And as a child, I noticed I would have to pack extra asthma medication when I would visit. And these experiences stuck with me, causing me to ask, why can't I breathe when I go to Birmingham? Fast forward 20 plus years uh, to grad school, and I had the opportunity to do a community health assessment of any community in the US. I selected North Birmingham, Alabama, home to my family where my parents grew up, um, and found out that it was also home to numerous hazards. Uh, it must be noted that when my grandparents purchased their homes, housing options in Birmingham were subject to redlining. So they didn't really have a choice on where they lived and what they and their family would be exposed to. Furthermore, I found that the community is present day riddled with numerous health disparities, low birth weight, cardiovascular disease, and other chronic conditions. Long story short, the the place where my family was raised is home to numerous environmental injustices, and there are health impacts that we still may face today because of that. So through this experience, I found the root of my passion in environmental health, which is justice. I also found my calling in environmental health to be the voice for the voiceless, 
at least that's what it was at that time. Now I see my opportunity to give voice to the voices because the voices have their own expertise, their lived experiences to, to share, and it needs to be shared. Uh, so one important thing that I want you to keep in mind as I go through this talk this evening is that climate change is experienced locally. The National Environmental Health Association's Executive Director, Dr. David Dijak, frequently describes environmental health as being inherently local. Well, the same can be said of climate change as evidenced in this quote through Drs. Jonathan Petz and Madeline Thompson. And importantly, I want you to consider that these differences can even be felt in different population segments, geographic locations, and even by neighborhood, as we'll touch on today. Examining the justice aspects of climate change means that we can't only look at climate in its own bubble. Therefore, I want to point out that as we face climate change, we face multiple health emergencies. Some are exacerbated by, by climate change and some confound our response to climate threats. Consider the three emergencies, climate change. 2020 was the second hottest year on record. We had a record-breaking number of 30 storms make landfall in the U.S. in an unprecedented wildfire season. COVID-19, which we are still dealing with today, and then our racial reckoning. Um, at this time last year began the reckoning with the death of Mr. George Floyd, who we acknowledge on this day. Um, so these are three health emergencies, and many health departments across the nation have have, have um, declared racism as a public health threat. So here, Dr. Jalan White Newsom, environmental justice expert and leader formerly of the Kresge Foundation, had this to say in a post that she authored last year. Across the US, climate change and COVID-19 are playing out in tandem. The warming planet drives increasingly extreme weather, compounding the pandemic's impacts and complicating disaster response. At the same time, these dual threats have exposed the profound inequities that divide and weaken us. So COVID-19 laid bare health disparities in the US, stating as early as April 2020, we began to notice differences in death rates um, fueled by determinants of health, racial disparities in housing, employment, education, and environmental exposures. And then you can see in the table below, data from November 2020 demonstrates some of the more lasting impacts COVID, COVID disparities um, have produced in our nation. So what I wanted to share with you that I find interesting is that many of the same populations um, bear greater, that bear greater risk to COVID also bear a heavier burden of the health threats of climate change. And these threats are vast. And you know, as we talk today, uh, we can see that we're all at risk to the health threats of climate change, but there are some groups that are more susceptible to these threats and climate change can actually act as a threat multiplier for them, exacerbating some of the inequities that these groups already experience. Children, for example, are uniquely susceptible. Their organ systems are still developing where exposures at certain developmental stages can have long or short-term consequences on their body. They breathe in more air, take in more fluid for their body size, meaning that they're more exposed than adults. They have oral exploratory habits. They put things in their, in their mouth. They crawl on the ground. Um, so they're closer to ground level pollutants and they depend on adults for their well being and care. Um, older adults, as you are well aware, are more likely to have chronic diseases that may render them more susceptible to the health threats of climate change. Um, in addition, they're also more likely to be socially isolated or may have limited mobility that can leave them more susceptible in extreme weather and extreme heat events. Impoverished communities may lack resources to support infrastructure updates or to recover following an extreme weather event. In addition, communities of color are more likely to live on the fence lines of industrial polluters. The strongest predictor of where hazardous polluters, polluters are located is race. It's not income, it's not education, but it's race. And people of color make up the majority of people living within three kilometers of a hazardous waste facility. Indigenous communities have close cultural and religious ties to the land and climate is affecting their ability to hunt and gather food from the land and pass on religious and cultural traditions. Where there's the threat of extreme weather, people have better health outcomes the sooner and further that they can evacuate to safety. But people with a disability may have challenges in evacuating safely if there are mobility challenges. 
Undocumented residents may not feel comfortable evacuating to a shelter in an extreme weather event for fear of deportation. And similarly, members of the LGBTQ plus community may not feel comfortable evacuating to shelters for fear of discrimination or worse. I share these unique burdens faced by these populations because we cannot truly address climate change if our most vulnerable don't benefit from action. Therefore, we can't meaningfully address climate change without addressing justice. Even the most well-intentioned efforts to address climate change will be undermined if justice is not at the center. So I'll briefly step through some of these health threats um, and, the and the inequities that are born or exacerbated by them. So we all deserve clean air to breathe. We, climate change, however, is decreasing the quality of the air that we breathe. Um, and that is contributing to increased risk of asthma, heart disease, um, even allergies. We have longer, hotter, warm longer, hotter, warm seasons and longer and more intense pollen seasons, which is creating a more intense allergy season. And these aren't just nuisances. These contribute to school and workplace absences. Children, communities of color, and impoverished communities, um, and those that are on the fence lines bear a higher burden of poor air quality. Wildfires are causing children to miss school, and we are having larger and more intense wildfire seasons. In parts of the U.S., up to 20% of the fine particulate matter to which children are exposed is resulting from wildfires, and we're finding that the particulate matter associated with wildfires is more toxic than the particulate matter that we're exposed to from traffic. So this is a great concern. But we also must examine air pollution's risk for um, infectious disease as well as chronic. The links between COVID-19 and air pollution in the U.S. Have been, um, have been noted here in the U.S., but also globally in Italy. And this study that's shown here is from England. And in these figures, you can see that an increase of one unit of fine particulate matter was associated with a 12% increase in COVID-19 cases. Also here in the US, research from Dr. Francesca Dominici and others shown in this first uh, set of US maps, their research suggests that even a one microgram per cubic meter increase in fine particulate matters associated with an 8% increase in COVID death rate, meaning that the more polluted cities have higher COVID mortality. Um, but Brant and others lay out a case for further investigation of the relationship between air pollution, COVID-19 mortalities, and, and disparities by race. And I share this because of the health disparities that have been laid bare by COVID. This warrants further need for more understanding around the disproportionate burden of air pollution on COVID mortality. So let's explore these links further through a natural case study here in the U.S. There was a regulatory pause on environmental regulation in the US. Um, and I'm not sharing this to disparage any federal agency because we do understand that the health of the workers is essential. Also, much of the public health workforce was called into COVID action on top of or surpassing their normal workload. We know that as early as April 2020, of, as, April, as early as April of 2020, 50% of the environmental health workforce was called into COVID response. So we do know that there was heavy strain on this population of workers. But this also, this pause on the regulation gives us an opportunity to understand the relationship between air pollution, COVID, and health disparities. So Claudia Perseco and her team at American University shared results potentially linking air pollution and COVID mortality during the regulatory pause. They found that during the regulatory pause, there were higher levels of PM2.5 and ozone. They found that there were higher COVID deaths. They also found disparities, that these outcomes were worse in counties that had a higher percentage of African-Americans. And this drove a hypothesis that counties with higher toxic releases have higher COVID rates. So I'll just quickly step through what they found. They looked at to the toxic release inventory provided by EPA and found that communities with more toxic release inventory sites had bigger increases in pollution during the pause, that counties with more sites had more COVID-19 deaths during the regulatory pause, and their results find a positive association between the, the number of those sites and COVID deaths, suggesting once more that higher pollution is linked with more COVID mortality. 
changing gears to extreme heat. And the 2016 US Climate and Health Assessment, the US Global Change Research Program reported that climate change has increased the frequency and intensity of extreme heat events. Populations that are most sensitive here include older adults that may have more chronic disease or may experience more social isolation, children that spend more time outdoors and really don't know, don't have the capacity to know when they've overdone it um, in terms of heat and exercise. Uh, communities of color and impoverished communities are more likely to be in urban heat islands. Um, and we've even found uh, more most recent data that redlined communities have higher heat exposure. Uh, so there are a couple populations I wanted to point out for your attention. Um, if you're looking at this table from CDC in 2020 and the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, they found that um, whites or Caucasians had the highest number of deaths, but that American Indian actually have the highest death rate, um, followed by African Americans. I wanted to point that out as some populations that are uniquely susceptible to heat. Then in the second figure, another population that is susceptible include non-US citizens. So this study that was published in the American Journal of Public Health Special Supplement on Climate Change and Environmental Justice examined deaths by citizenship status. And they found that 4% of the deaths um, were among US citizens, while 96% were among non-US citizens. You may not realize you're actually looking at a bar graph here because the statistic is so stark, but 96% of non-US citizens compared to 4% of US citizens. So another key population with which to be aware. Um, changing gears to extreme weather, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing surface water temperatures, making the frequency and intensity of extreme heat, uh, extreme weather events, both more frequent and more extreme. I highlight pictures from Hurricane Harvey and that focus on children, noting the susceptibility of children in extreme weather events that they are dependent on adults to make decisions for their well-being and for their safety. Also, they bear a heavy mental health burden of exposure um, to climate and in particular extreme weather. Injustice with the exposure to these storms lies in the recovery. So resource-rich communities can return to normal quickly. Meanwhile, communities of color and low-income communities in Houston, for example, were still working to rebuild a year after Hurricane Harvey. And because the industrial area was in closer proximity to the communities of color and low-income populations, which we can um, at least in part attribute to redlining and racial segregation, these communities were far more susceptible when those industries were flooded, leaving contamination to breach their drinking water supply. Um, from Hurricane Harvey, we know that over 30,000 were evacuated, um, that there were deaths that resulted. And also because of damage to the infrastructure, this can contribute to a loss of access to needed health services in a time where we may need the most. And as I pointed out, there was water contamination and um, there, were, there were sightings of uh, gastrointestinal illness as well as skin rash. Uh, so climate causes increases in, increases in extremes in precipitation, flooding on one hand and drought on the other. We've talked briefly about flooding, uh, but putting the focus on drought and uh, populations that uh, bear a heavier burden, impoverished communities, agricultural workers, agricultural communities, uh, they bear a heavy economic impact and thus mental health impacts as well. Rural communities, those that are reliant on private drinking water systems may be more susceptible to um, contamination or uh, re reductions in water uh, or access to water, tribal communities. Um, we, COVID also, um, for, for many informed us that there are tribal communities here in the US that do not have close access to running water. Uh, so this also leaves tribal communities at increased threat when it comes to drought. Uh, so in the last of the impacts, climate increases the amount and geographic distribution of disease carrying vectors, including mosquitoes and ticks. So for populations that are quite sensitive, we wanna consider um, pregnant people. We want to consider children. Um, Lyme disease 
uh, increases has been, have been noted across the US. You can see the change in the span um, between 2001 and 2014. You can also see cases of West Nile virus increasing across the US and also changing in their geographic distribution. And also you can see in this figure, there was a tripling of vector-borne disease um, from mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas when you compare 2016 to 2014. I'm sorry, to 2004. So I, I've mentioned that climate change not only affects our physical health, but it affects our mental health as well. Exposure to extreme weather can increase um, our risk of stress, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression. And Hurricane Katrina, nearly half of Hurricane Katrina survivors develop the mood or anxiety disorder, and one in six develop a post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't want to leave you in the dark space. I do want to share briefly about what some are doing. Um, here at University of Louisville, we've partnered with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the Nature Conservancy for the Green Heart Project. And in Green Heart, we're looking at heart disease and, and air pollution before planting trees. We are planting trees this summer. Um, and then we're going to look at heart disease and air pollution after um, as a as a randomized controlled trial to understand trees and as an intervention to protect health in this changing climate. Um, other things that people are doing are health and all policies. Uh, using that collaborative approach can incorporate health decisions into decision making with equity at the center. And then there's also community-based participatory research. Um, and this allows the community to inform the decision-making and be meaningfully involved from the decision of what is the problem all the way through, um, through what will be done and how will it be evaluated. So with that, um, I know we are short on time. I will go ahead and end now. I thank you so much for your time. I celebrate the work that you do, and I look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Natasha, thank you so much. A lot of great information there. I feel like I'm going to have to watch that two or three times over to really retain uh, the, the info that you were able to share with us, with us. So thank you so much. That was excellent. Elena, if you don't mind going now, it'd be great to, to follow up with. Sure, absolutely. Let me... One moment, I'm just. Here we are. Hi, so my name's Elena, and as um, Bob introduced, I'm the, the program director for Brace Illinois at the UIC School of Public Health. We work with the Illinois Department of Public Health, big picture is to help prepare the state for the health effects from climate change. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, basically how natural disasters are also social disasters and how we can try to make sure that health equity is being considered in our climate change work. So many of you may recall that um, there was a really large and fatal heat wave in Chicago in 1995. And this picture looks very innocent, but it was actually taken on one of the days in July of 1995, um, where temperatures soared with heat index to above 120 degrees. I often say that heat um, is a silent disaster, but it is the most deadly disaster. You can't see a heat wave, like you can see a flood or a wildfire or a hurricane but it's very fatal. And so in 1995, there were um, six days that were extremely hot and it led to the most fatal heat wave on record in US history. And not only was it a, a social disaster, but it was also a political disaster, which I think a lot of natural disasters are. Um, but you, you saw throughout the week how the death toll was rising 118 to 300 to 436. And then after um, an epidemiological study, there were over 700 people that died from this heat wave. This is a picture of a mass grave 
that the Cook County Coroner's Office had to create in Homewood, Illinois, because they were so overwhelmed with unclaimed bodies. So when I think of a mass grave, I, don't, I, I think of a war-torn country, not the city of Chicago after a heat wave. And research finds that based on the greenhouse gas emissions that we are currently on, uh, or in terms of rising, um, we can see, we, we should expect to see heat waves that are as fatal as the 1995 Chicago heat wave happen every other year by the end of the century. So the reality is, is that, as I mentioned, this was not just a natural disaster. It was a political disaster, but also a social disaster. So I'm gonna talk about how this was a social disaster. What you're looking at right now is a map of the Chicago community areas with the highest heat related deaths. So the darker the color, the higher the rate. Um, if you're not familiar with the city of Chicago, um, you'll see that a lot of the neighborhoods that arise are in the south and west side. So if we look at a, some social indicators, uh, this was around the same period um, per capita income. And so the darker the color, the lower the per capita income. And then if we look at highest homicide rates for this year of 94 to 95, um, you're just looking at the, 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 the shaded in communities are the ones with the highest homicide rate. So if we look at all three of these maps together, I've circled some of this very specific neighborhoods that not only had the highest death rate, but had the lowest per capita income and the highest homicide rate. And so you see how there are these social aspects that are existing when a disaster hits and it can just exacerbate the disaster for those communities. So there were, as I mentioned, there, there were many epidemiological studies. This was one that was conducted after the heat wave. And these were a couple of the risk factors, being black, being elderly, being medically compromised, not having access to air conditioning, being socially isolated and the type of living structure that you lived in were all risk factors. An interesting point about access to air conditioning was that even having air conditioning in your apartment building lobby was a protective factor. And um, the social isolation, there were a number of people who died were found alone in their apartment buildings. And now when there is an extreme heat or cold event and you hear, you know, please check in on your neighbors, it actually comes from this 1995 Chicago heat wave. There was also a sociological study um, that was conducted. And what was interesting about this study is it actually compared two neighboring neighborhoods. Um, and it found that race, violence, poverty, social isolation, and built environment were risk factors. So you see some of these overlapping risk factors. Um, in the sociological study, there were a lot of interviews that they did, and they found that people um, from one neighborhood felt that they did not feel safe leaving their house to either be outside in the streets or leaving their house susceptible to burglary. Um, the other neighborhood, people felt very comfortable going to neighborhood stores, banks even, where there's air conditioning um, and participating in regular day life, but also going to air conditioned locations. So what do we do with this information? Um, you know, we know that there are neighborhoods, there are communities that are more susceptible. One important thing that we need to do is be able to locate them and identify them. And I'm gonna share two tools that I know of for the Chicago metropolitan area. Um, I know that there are states, there are other cities that have developed similar tools and indices to help locate and, and identify priority areas. So the Nature Conservancy of Illinois created Chicago's green print. Now, 
it's it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's not just Chicago, but it's the the additional it's the metropolitan area of Chicago. They created this green print to show which Chicago and suburban neighborhoods are at, mo at most risk and where um, nature based solutions can be used. And so they have one for flooding, for heat and for air quality. So I just picked one to show you um, what they're doing and, and the different indicators that they have included in their map that they overlaid to ultimately come up with a, an air quality risk area, right? So you can see which parts are at greatest risk, not just based on environmental conditions, but social factors as well. And so this can be used to help inform, okay, where do we need to prioritize? Where do we need to literally put money into, invest in? The Chicago Metropolitan Planning Agency, they've created uh, a flood susceptibility index. Um, you can see the six factors that they've used. They also have a guide and how to use it. Um, you know, this doesn't have as many social factors, which I think is a bit of, um, it's not necessarily a flaw, but I think that the social factors really highlight how there are certain neighborhoods that are, are, are just much more impacted by these events. Um, but these tools are really helpful in planning, right? These are planning tools. They can help identify where we need to invest. So here at BRACE, you know, we're trying to think about how can we incorporate climate equity into our work. And I've, I've created this equation, and this is not a published equation, because there really isn't published work on climate and health equity. But there are a number of different ways to look at it. So health equity, it combines environmental justice, and it combines climate resilience. Um, and so all these different ways to look at vulnerability, essentially, uh, when it comes to climate change and health can help inform what we do. So what are, what are these indices? Um, there are a number of them. I've listed five that I have found that I have found to be very helpful. Um, you know, they range from resiliency, specific to resiliency, to specifically on climate change and health, to more focused on climate change. Um, and some of the indicators, you know, the, the, the topics include the built environment, tree canopy, per percentage of, of, of tree canopy in an area, um, uh, percentage of impervious pavement. Um, but it also includes housing type, you know, what, what's the majority of the population? What type of housing are they living in? Do they rent or own? How close are they to public transportation? So all these different factors, and there are a number of them, I especially want to highlight the NAACP's equity and building resilience and adaptation planning. It's super detailed. It can maybe feel overwhelmed, but I think it's very helpful in thinking about, you know, what are these indicators and metrics that we can use to actually identify where there's vulnerability, but then most importantly, which we're trying to do now is how do we make sure to ensure that we are addressing these climate and health equity issues? So what we're trying to do is taking the take these indicators and these metrics and apply it to our evaluation work and, and track and see, are we actually addressing some of these equity concerns in the work that we do? I wanted to close out with a case study similar um, to Natasha, kind of more on a positive note. Um, so Medellin, Colombia created this green corridor um, system, really, they're all connected. And they've been highlighted, they've been honored for the work that they did. There are 30 in the city and they targeted neighborhoods with lowest share of green areas. So again, taking an indicator that they probably used in defining, you know, where are our most vulnerable neighborhoods. And then also they trained 75 new gardeners to take care of the green corridors and they targeted people from at-risk communities. Um, and so th these are a couple of the numbers in terms of what they did and then what they found 
was that there were a number of benefits besides the obvious ones of reducing greenhouse gas and exposure to high temperatures, but also reducing stress, improving air quality, reducing crime and job creation. And so this is kind of the back end of taking, they took the from the front end, where do we need to invest? They did the project and then on the back end, they wanted to see, okay, did we actually address some of these equity concerns? Uh, and, and they did. It's, it's actually a really phenomenal project. I, I recommend taking a look at it. Um, if you just Google Medellin Green Corridors, many different resources will pop up. Um, and so with that, I, I would like to, I'm not sure who's going next after me. Um, this is just, you know, I figured both physicians and climate change professionals would appreciate this. Obviously, it's not saying one is worse than the other, but they're both there. <laughs> Um, so I'm not sure who I'm passing it on to, but I, I guess I'll just pass it back. Thank you so much, Elena. And that's a great uh, cartoon. I'm going to have to go find that one on the internet afterwards and share it. Thank you. And that the, your ending is a perfect transition to, to Ray Bell. So next, I'd like to introduce Ray, who's going to talk a little bit more on the solution side. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I am from Faith in Place, and we are a interfaith uh, environmental um, agency, and we work state uh, statewide in Illinois. And we actually help um, all houses of worship to be better stewards of the earth. Um, so we're going to start with the project that we started out in 2016. And the, the project was to establish a, a stormwater program to educate uh, communities, especially um, EJ communities, about, um, um, about stormwater. Uh, we use the uh, Center of Neighbor, Neighbor Tech, Neighborhood Technology, their preva prevalence and um, um, urban flooding study in 2014. One of the things, some of the things we found out was the study found that um, Urban flooding in Cook County, uh, Illinois is chronic and sy systematic. There, there are 181,000 claims in 97% of the Cook County zip codes in a five-year period. The average payouts of the claims were about a little more than $4,000. All of the claims uh, in total were about $73 million in a five-year period. 70% had flooding three or more times in, the, in that five year period and 20% of them had flooding 10 times or more. And this is in the inner city. 84% uh, of them suffered from stress uh, that, that affected their health and 13% had some kind of chronic illness after, uh, after the flooding um, issues. 41% lost part of their property, 63% lost values and of course, I'm. One of the 63%, I have no beautiful pictures of me being a baby anymore because they were lost in the flood. 74% um, lost hours of work in, uh, for the cleanup. And of course, the claims that were made are across uh, income groups, 18 or 60, 67% of the highest uh, 27 zip codes that had damage were uh, from low income or brown and black communities. This is a map, it's kind of hard to see, but this is the, um, the areas that are most hardest hit. And as you can see, it's the west side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago. I live right here in this area code, which is 60617. Um, just to talk about um, stormwater runoff. So what we did, we, we came up with a uh, program where we actually went out to houses of worship and talked to them about stormwater runoff. We talked to them about the effects of, of it on their health, we talked about you know, how it affects their neighborhood, how it affects their property damage and some things that we came up with uh, some solutions that what they could do. And um, because they just felt that they could just sit there and, and there was nothing they could do. They really felt totally helpless. Um, we call this suffering in silence where people actually, this is uh, just some people's basement where you know, you suffer in silence and um, I also say that you know you, you think that 
nobody nobody is can help you with this and you take what I also call the walk of shame is that where you're going out the next morning throwing things away that have been uh destroyed on your, in, in your property you know and you sometimes you after a major storm in Chicago you can drive through the alleys and see all of this furniture and all of these um things that people have thrown away that were destroyed uh, in this uh, in this rain event of the day before. So what does resilience look like for the urban residents? I mean, you know, what can it do? And we tell them that, you know, you can't wait on Superman. There are no large, great infrastructure projects coming to your neighborhoods. You know, they're not going to spend billions of dollars or millions of dollars in these urban neighborhoods to solve these problems. Uh, basically, we, had, we instruct them to uh, talk to your alderman to get maintenance on your um, maintenance on your sewer system. Some of the times it's just serious neglect in maintenance. Um, the um, and the stormwater system, the uh, sewer system in front of my house had not been maintained. I, I guess I have no idea, but uh, we did get them to come out and look. There was a manhole that was supposed to be five feet deep. The manhole was about six inches deep because the rest was still it was full of debris, six, it was about six inches. A five foot manhole was actually totally covered in debris and they had to actually come and suck the debris out. But those are, that's just regular maintenance that you have to pretty much force your Congress people to do that just was not being done. That's one of the things. The other thing that we talked about was rain gardens. Uh, this is one rain garden that we actually built at one of the congregations, this rain garden, um, it uh, keeps about 37,000, 38,000 gallons of uh, stormwater from going into the uh, from into the um, the combined sewer system uh, on an annual basis. We actually took the um, we took the gutters that were that would normally go into the, um, the combined sewer system. We run those gutters. We run those gutters into uh, straight into the rain garden. So now that though that water is actually filled right into the rain garden instead of going into uh, the gutters. And we did that at a number of houses of worship and we're teaching other houses of worship how to do that. Um, also, we talked to, we talked to the, um, the uh, members of all the houses of worship. We have rain barrel giveaways. We um, got with the, uh, the, uh, the Water Reclamation District and they gave us um, 500 rain barrels to give away. And we gave away um, 500 rain barrels and taught, um, taught people how to install them, how to maintain them and keep them. And you know, just disconnecting um, the, um, the downspouts from, the, um, from going into the combined sewer system. You know, one house actually, an average house uh, in a one inch rain actually puts 600 to a, to a thousand gallons of um, storm water into uh, the sewer system, just one house. So if you if you can disconnect those um, um, those downspouts, uh, then you can definitely save 600 to 1,000 gallons in a one inch one inch rain event at one at one individual house. We do we talk we talk to the members about how to advocate. This is um, Carrie Steele, who at that time was a commissioner. She is now the president. Of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, she went out to she went out with us, and um, on almost every occasion, we went out for our rain barrels, and she actually helped us talk to the community about what they could also do. Uh, you know, not sitting around, as I say, waiting on Superman because Superman's not coming to those neighborhoods. We have to do things ourselves. This is another a rain garden. Of all the five rain gardens that we put in, we are saving a little more than 175 thousand gallons of water annually from going into the stormwater system. And we um, put in that about 2,100 feet of uh, permanent green infrastructure that was installed around the neighborhoods. And we're actually showing other communities how to do this themselves. We talked about a rain barrel. I mean, a rain barrel, uh, we have a 55 gallon rain barrel that you can put in. And if you use a rain barrel properly where you can, um, where, you, you, where you, know, you take the water and you use it in your plants or anything that out, outdoor activity, no, no drinking water, you can save about you can save about three thousand gallons of stormwater runoff from going into the combined sewer system, where you can mitigate flooding in your area. This project that we talked about, we redirect about six hundred eighty 
um, a thousand gallons of uh, stormwater a year annually from this project that we put out uh, for uh, in faith in place. Again, you can see with the community involvement where we actually went out and um, this is where we're, give, we're giving away a hundred rain barrels at this one congregation. We also uh, got the youth in the area involved. We, 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 at each congregation, we had a, uh, a painting, a uh, rain barrel painting event where the youth got out and, and painted the rain barrels and, you know, and decorated them. Decorated them. Uh, we also taught the youth how to uh, install the rain barrels for the elderly that did not know how to install them. So we taught them how to install them and we got siphons. Um, um, we had a sponsor that went out and paid the youth to actually install the rain barrel. So they, they got summer jobs installing the rain barrel. So that, that also helped out. As okay, you talk to your legislators, uh, we got municipal involvement. We got the media involvement uh, on the project. Uh, one of the other great things we did is we used returning citizens, citizens that were having a very hard time getting back into the workforce after they spent some time in jail, unfortunately. Um, we actually uh, use a company that used returning citizens to actually build the rain, build the rain gardens. So we actually gave back to the community that way. Um, this is another uh, one of the uh, larger um, um, rain gardens that just got put in. It was, uh, and you see, there's no uh, growth right here at the time. Actually, I was trying to change the picture really quick before uh, <laughs> Elena finished, but I didn't get to change it to it because we have a, nut, a much newer picture where the garden is beautiful now. I was trying to change it, but she finished too quick, so I didn't get to change the picture. Um, this is another one, another rain garden at a different congregation. Um, and um, that's it. And um, we can talk about lessons learned if uh, people want to have questions during the during the Q and A. So I'll go back to uh, Robert. Thank you, Ray. Thanks for ending on you know such a positive conversation. It seems like you know, just simple interventions, rain barrels, gardens, can really have a lasting impact. And at this point, I want to open up the Q and A session. I think the the easiest way is to to type the questions into the chat and I'll be more than happy to read them. I guess I'll, I'll start off first question for you, Ray. You know, this is an intervention that seems very straightforward and something that we can, you know, implement in other cities or towns and neighborhoods across the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. What would be your recommendation if we were to try to initiate such, such a project where one doesn't exist before? Who are the, who are your allies in the community that you would recommend that we reach out to first and foremost? Well, for, for Faith in Place, we actually work with congregations. And congregations are usually the center point of a community. You know, if you can get into a congregation and talk, you can actually talk to not only the community at large, but there are a lot of people that, you know, drive into the church. So uh, that's where we start. We start with the congregation. That's why we built the rain gardens at the, at the church. So people would, would come by the church and say, well, what's going on at the church? Once you get that kind of... Um, um, you know, people involved, you get, now you get the encouragement. Now you can actually talk to the members of the church about stormwater management. Then, the, then you can also talk to the surrounding communities. We also, use the, uh, we also use the Water Reclamation District because, I mean, people want to talk to Water Reclamation District about, you know, why is this happening in my community? So you, now you get the, uh, we, got, we brought the water commissioners out with us and the water commissioners actually donated rain barrels um as they as they came out to the uh, to the community and um we we talked to we got got all the commissioners out and um of course you try to talk to the talk to the news media and the news media came out and um matter of fact every news media in chicago actually came out to one of our events to actually promote that information around um the city also great thanks for that um a question i want to Put out to everybody here that's come up it's just resources it seems like you know many of us on this call are clinicians and are really trying to be patient resources and patient advocates and even personal experience today there's, there's a lot of questions that come up on when we speak to politicians or people that aren't familiar with the subject are there resources out there that we can refer to particularly when it comes to environmental justice that, that we can use to be allies and advocates for our patients
So I have uh, a set of resources I'm really excited to share. These come from the American Public Health Association, and they, they share about the different ways that climate change impacts health. Um, and it's written at an eighth grade reading level, and it's written with the intent of being handed to, uh, to people in the community. Um, there's two sets of them. One is with the intent for physicians to share with their patients. Others are for the intent of, um, of public health practitioners to share with members of the community. So I'm going to share the link to all of them here in the chat and their fact sheets. Most of them are, are one pager front and back and easy to share, great imagery in them as well. I'll also share a set of infographics that was developed for a social media campaign. Uh, to help share about the health threats of climate as well. And, and this there, were a couple, there were a couple questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, Barb Sabaj from League of Win Women Voters did have a question when um, Ramat was speaking. Did the Deep Tunnel Project help at all? Yes, the Deep Tunnel Project helped, but the 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 problem with is that once the once the if the water comes fast enough it will still flood in the area because the, the, the pipes are just too small. We, we've actually put too many people in, in, in the area and there's no, um, there's no green area in, in, in the urban area. So it will actually flood. What the, what the Deep Tuttle Project has done is that once it floods within, within about 30 minutes or an hour later, the water will start to reside, but now the damage is done. So the, before the deep tunnel projects, the, the water may have stayed, you know, a, an hour or two hours, or, or I mean, excuse me, a day or maybe longer. I mean, it, uh, I can remember years, years before the deep tunnel project when it flooded, I, you know, the water sat in your basement, you know, seven, eight hours, if not longer. But now it, it, it'll still flood, but we'll say about 30 minutes later after the rain event is over, then, the water flows out quickly, but unfortunately, the deep tunnel project does not stop the urban flooding. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Ram Kumar um, from the Illinois Clinicians from Climate Action also asked about cisterns, mm -hmm. talking about the um, the rain barrels. Right. Well, and, and um, there are, there are a number of uh, organizations that use cisterns. Matter of fact, there is a a brewery not too far from me that actually uses. Um, cisterns to collect their water, they filter that water and they use that water to make their, uh, make their beer. So there are a number of um, people that use cisterns and we have a number of uh, neighborhood uh, farms and neighborhood gardens that use the cisterns around the, around the city area. Yes, so there's a number of large cisterns in the Chicago area. And then I had one question and no, Ramon, if you have any comments, but um, um, at the climate table, one of the communities that we were concerned with, and actually this came up with the environmental justice um, bill that was um, we were discussing with the Illinois legislator, but legislature. Um, do you have any comments on the situation um, that is has been happening in Centerville, Illinois? Uh, it's funny. I, I was just reading about that earlier today, and because um, you know I figured it would come up. Actually, uh, I have don't know much about it we do have an, we do have an advocate um that's in springfield they, they're not on the call now so i, I it's, it's a very bad situation unfortunately i i read about that people have been dealing with this um situation for a decade and um, the government in the area is passing a buck from from mayor to mayor not actually addressing the issue um and uh, I mean, I really don't know how to um, to address to to address this, but it's just a horrible situation that they're living in an area where their drainage system is being blocked on a regular basis. And in turn, that sewer water is now pushing back into their community on a regular basis, and they've totally um, they've totally lost all their property. I mean, people say every time it rains, they have to go somewhere, and they have really nowhere to go, and um, and no one, no one is assisting, assisting them. And I looked at a um, uh, some information from Tammy Duckworth and um, and uh, Senator Dirksen, and they are they're offering state aid, but they're saying that 
the uh, people in the area, the mayors and the people in the area don't have a plan on how to use the money. So they can't give them the money because they don't have a plan. Thanks, Ray. Another question for, for the group here uh, from Brenna. Uh, just an emphasis on the community-led environmental justice projects. Do you have any best practices on how health professionals can best develop community partnerships that are truly community-based and community-led uh, and how to drive more funding towards those projects? Really just leave that question open for the three of you. Well, I mean, this is Ray from Faith and Place. I mean, there are a number of wonderful um, uh, nonprofits that are doing great on um, on the ground work in, in the community um, that need assistance. You know, Faith and Place, of course, is, is one. Um, and the, C, the, the Sierra Club that we work with, um, the Center of, Na of, um, of Neighborhood uh, Technology, uh, those it, those uh, groups that we work with uh, hand in hand, uh, but I'm I'm pretty sure that you know um, uh, you know just using the internet and find out which groups are in that area and working you know and doing uh, doing a little research on that on that group. But there are a number of groups that need us need the need the, uh, the assistance that are willing to do the work if they if they are uh, helped out with funding. Mm -hmm. Something that I'll add, um, I wish I, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but I know that there have also been situations where researchers come in to do community-based participatory work and the community actually identifies concerns that don't necessarily align directly with per se climate change, but you can address them as well. And it's really important to address them as well because they're identified needs by the community and, um, and connecting the dots between, because I often say that like climate change and health is like the 12 degrees of, the, what is it, the, the, the Kevin Bacon game where you can connect Kevin Bacon to like anybody by six degrees or something like that. Climate change and health is very much like that, right? It is connected to so many different aspects of our health, of our economy, um, of our built environment. And, and so it's really important that when that work is being done, that if there is an issue that's being addressed, um, that that is a concern, that that concern is addressed and potentially providing a climate lens with it. Excellent. I have nothing further to add other than echoing what's been shared. Um, it's very important to listen to what the community actually wants um, and support community in those goals. And it might not start off being climate change, um, but through building trust and building support over time, um, as Elena pointed out, um, we can connect a lot to climate change and how action on climate will benefit. Thank you for that. Just time for just one or two more questions. Uh, just referring back to the flooding issue, uh, question on whether combined sewers have an effect on decreasing the flooding rates. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, with that uh, capacity. Well, combined sewers to me actually increased the, uh, the use. I mean, because combined, because um, so Chicago has combined sewer system and the sewer system, uh, it, it, and what, what, it, what it basically means is that the sewer system, it was built as a sewer system, not a system to actually um, take stormwater. They that was just an after effect. They said, "Well, why don't we throw the stormwater into the sewer system?" But remember, it was designed as a sewer a sewer system, not um, to actually run stormwater off. And so, um, it's actually it because of the rain events and how they're getting to be larger and larger. The system just cannot handle that. It was not. It was not designed for that. Gotcha. Good to know. Mm -hmm. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to, to ask away. But I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're coming to the hour mark here, and I just again want to thank our panelists. This was uh, an amazing discussion and, and something that I have to watch again just to make sure I capture all that great information and, and great resources. So I just want to thank you and, and thank everybody else who was attending this evening. Uh, really appreciate your time being here and, and hopefully this is something uh, we can build off of.
both from an environmental justice perspective, as well as the relationships we've established over this webinar series in the Great Lakes community to see if we can combine efforts and really make some positive change. So again, thank you to everybody this evening. Okay, thank you.